dealing with uncertainty is a uh, essential part of entrepreneurship. I guess you could probably say it's an essential part of life. Um, but uh, I could have titled this talk Risk or something like that. But I think um, uncertainty is better because um, there's a lot of misunderstandings about risk that are, that are in the popular press because entrepreneurs are frequently called risk takers um, as if that's really the, um, the essential description of what the activity is. And I think it's, it's more insightful to think about entrepreneurship as dealing with uncertainty uh, and, uh, and the behavior you have with regard to uncertainty. Um, because risk is, um, cuts a lot of different ways. Uh, for example, how many of you have uh, jumped out of an airplane with a parachute? Okay, that's a, that's a risky behavior. Uh, how many of you uh, have, um, you know, skied off the top of a mountain with uh, an, an unmarked trail? Okay, that's, that's risky behavior. How many of you uh, fly a small airplane? Okay. Uh, how many of you uh, buy lottery tickets? One, okay. Uh, how many of you go to Las Vegas to gamble? Okay, so these are, these are all, uh, you know, risky behaviors. Um, and, uh, but I don't think any of us would say that, well, all those things are entrepreneurial. I mean, I mean, jumping out of an airplane without a, par with a parachute, without a parachute, well, that, I don't know what that is, but uh, with a parachute, no one would say, oh, that's entrepreneurial behavior. Now, you might say, well, it's correlated maybe to the way you'd make a business decision, but, but I think if you think of uncertainty, um, it, uncertainty is really thinking through what you might call a calculated risk. So entrepreneurship, I'm going to present to you as making calculated risks as opposed to just taking risks. Um, but there's also different attitudes toward risk, which is there's some people that don't, that are extremely risk averse. And even when things are 99% certain, they just really don't want to move forward. There's other people that are risk takers or, or let's just say, um, uh, uh, wild and crazy who might take a risk where there might be a less of a 1% chance of success, but they're still going to do it. So th those of you, uh, so a lot of it has to do with the calculation of really what the percentages are, and that's more dealing with uncertainty than it is just the notion of risk. So uh, this quote is from Niels Bohr, the, the great Danish physicist, and it seems it sounds funny, uh, but it's obviously also true. I'm going to break an uncertainty uh, into four different categories. I'm going to talk about each one because they're different, and there's different things you can use to address them. The, the first one is just ignorance about what's going on. And the analogy would be, you're in a parachute, you, you did jump out of an airplane on a parachute, and you land on a battlefield. And just stuff's going on. You, you don't know what side you're on, you don't know, you know who's shooting at whom, it's dusty, it's difficult. You simply don't have information about the situation. So that's kind of like one kind of uncertainty. Uh, we'll call it lack of information, ignorance, whatever. The second kind of uncertainty is when you have some data and there's a trend and you're just not sure what kind of trend it is. So it's the, it's the, um, the exercise of extrapolating or understanding trends. And there's uh, obviously a lot of people do this with regard to the stock market. Um, uh, and there's questions about it. Is it a random walk? Is it not? Is it truly a trend? Is there not? We'll talk a little bit about that. The third one is what I call luck, the law of unintended consequences. And, uh, and what that implies for, for uncertainty. And finally, I'm just going to touch on uh, quantum disruptions, the notion that uh, things are inherently unpredictable. Um, and uh, what can you do about that? And, and what does that mean? And how can you understand whether you're in, you're in one of those environments or not? The backdrop to all of this is that we're currently experiencing an unbelievable explosion of information. And by information, I mean information that's somehow captured in, in a digital format. Uh, it may or may not be saved, but it's information that is now in a form that really wasn't there, well, certainly wasn't there, say, 50 or 60 or 70 years ago. 
um, and it's on a tremendous exponential explosion. Uh, so much so that the world is different today than it was in 2005, and very different than it was in 2000. I mean, this is like current history. As a matter of fact, the world is going to, in 2013 is going to be a lot different than it is today. Hard to believe. This is a graph. These are, are exabytes. Uh, an exabyte is probably a term we're going to become familiar with. First, we kind of had to learn gigabyte and terabyte and that kind of stuff. An exabyte is a million terabytes. Um, how, how much is a terabyte? 15 terabytes is the entire contents of the U.S. Library of Congress, which is pretty much all books written in English and a lot of books not written in English. So um, where was mankind 50 years ago? It, you couldn't even see it. It would be, you know, like a little tiny, it'd be a width of that line. And this is exploding. The other thing that's really interesting is the... Um, the red line is how much storage capacity we have. The blue line is how much information or data is being generated. What's interesting about those lines? There's a lot of information being lost. Yeah, a lot. Of, you know, it's, it's been true for most of man's history that we could store what we generated. Well, it was very expensive, by the way, before paper was invented. So that was probably a time when there was more information and hard to store it because paper was extremely expensive. But, you know, recent history, you know, 1900, 1950, how did you store information? You, just, you, you printed it. We didn't have a paper shortage. But now, so much stuff is being generated and it's not being saved. So things are kind of being lost, to, so to speak. Now, a lot of it you say, well, why, why is it worth saving? You know, Twitter messages. I mean, I don't know, like, uh, you, know, you know, different kinds of things that you can digitize. Well, it does have some implications for who is saving what, because you now have significant issues about triage in that what should you store and what shouldn't you store and what is going to be valuable and what's not. So that's the backdrop. So I'm going to talk a little bit about guesstimation, which, which um, is, it could be a casual phrase, but I actually think there's a, an interesting way that you can find out more than you think you might be able to. What guesstimation is in, in, in this consideration is it's the outsider's way of calculating insider's information. And let's just assume for 99% of the time that you're going to be operating in the world of business, you're going to be an outsider. It's hard to be an insider. Uh, and uh, sometimes you're going to have insider information, but most of the time you're not. So how can you try to level the playing field uh, against those who are insiders, who have more information you, than you do simply because they're involved intimately in that activity. You do it through a triangulation of facts and you use common sense. I don't know how else to explain it, but um, let me give you an example here. Jack and Jill plan to sell special UM tailgate barbecues. Those are like uh, green shell with an orange grill. Very attractive. And want to know the per game size of their target market so they can print up game day flyers. How many flyers do they need? Okay, this is your this has been parachuted into the battlefield. You know, I don't know about you, but I don't know anything about this. I mean, you know, so so how do you what do you what do you what do you know? Well, let's build a model for how we would figure this out. I mean, let's let's just use common sense. So how would we try to calculate how many game day flyers they need? Well. The, the, this is not the only way to do this, by the way, but this is just one model. But let me just see whether it passes your common sense smell test. Well, we take the stadium maximum capacity. And, yeah, after all, people are going to the game, so uh, maybe there's an overflow crowd, but you know, that's not a bad first approximation, that there's a you know, maximum capacity. But we need to adjust that by the average game day attendance. Because we don't want to print up flyers for the entire stadium and find out only 50% of the people showed up and there's a lot of empty seats. That would be wasteful. We need to know, though, because this is for tailgating, some kind of indication of, well, who shows up early? I mean, it's no good to be trying to sell barbecues to people who show up two minutes before the game or come in the second quarter because they're not tailgating. So you, you want to kind of reduce this down by how many people show up significantly early. Then you've got to understand, well, how many people bring their own food? Because if they, they're buying hot dogs, 
you know, at the vendors, well, they're not going to bring a, they're not in the market for a barbecue, potentially. And then we need to understand how many are already on a grill, because you're not gonna, they're not going to buy two of them. Does this make sense? Is this a, like a reasonable? Uh, who would bring food that isn't on the grill? Now, I'm not buying the last one. You, you're selling a special grill. So you, you I, I'm sorry, who don't already own a grill they bring to games. Yeah, but I mean, yeah. you're selling a special new lemon grill. Right, so maybe they would buy two. Yeah. Okay, so you're saying you might be able to. Sweatshirt, you might be able to. Go buy a new lemon sweatshirt. Right, okay, right. Sorry, thank you. And this one here, why would they bring a, uh, their own food if uh, they, they might bring cold food? So sandwiches, yep. cokes, you know. In other words, they're not going there simply to buy from the vendors. They're, they're bringing something, uh, but they're maybe not cooking it. Yeah. The big problem with this is uh, it's not the same people that show up every week. That's right, not the same people. People might come once a year. Is it Oklahoma or is it Appalachian? That's possible. Yeah, yeah. So you might you might want to try to get some sort of repeat attendance kind of thing. Yeah. One other variable might be uh, the percentage who are home home fans versus away at the game, because they wouldn't want. Yep. Okay. Yep. So you could refine this by adding a couple more variables, right? Uh, but let me just ask you, sort of as a first pass, you know, is this pretty good for a, for a first pass? I mean, you're, you're just trying to get sort of to some kind of common sense model. Okay, now the problem is, how can we fi possibly find out this information? You know, we're not going to be spending a million dollars on market research. So how can we do this? Google. Google is the number one way. Okay, so what what do we what do we got here? Well, getting the official capacity of the stadium is really easy. You just go to University of Miami, and you just go to the, the section on football, and they, they tell you it's seventy-five thousand five hundred forty seats. Okay, we got that number, pretty pretty accurately. Well, how many people attend? Well, there you can go through a, a news search. There happened to be a two thousand eight article about UM attendance, and said sixty-one percent of the uh, seats are taken on an average game. Okay, so what about the 2009 uh, season? Was it better? Okay, so, but we got a ballpark figure. Okay, 61% is not, not bad. It's, it, we're not going to use 20% in the model. We're not going to use 90% in the model, but we could kind of play with that. And, and uh, There's something called tailgating.com. They do national surveys, and, uh, and they say that 50% uh, of the people show up early. It may not be true for UM, but it's not a bad starting point for this model. You know, we can refine it later as we get more data. Um, the same guys, tailgating.com, say 35% bring their own food. And, um, and then you go, there's an industry, believe it or not, that has to do with grills. And uh, they spend all their time talking about <coughs> barbecue grills. And they do intensive kinds of surveys for, for, the, uh, for the industry. And they estimate that 25% uh, of people who go to football games who have food don't bring their grill. Okay, uh, I mean, I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, I'm sorry. The 25% of go to people who go to football games don't have a grill. Okay, these are first estimates, but this takes 25 minutes on the computer. Okay, the information explosion makes data cheap if you bother to look for it. Was this true in 1950? No. You couldn't figure this out in 1950. 1950, you couldn't even get the capacity of the stadium, probably. You know, yeah. Um, uh, in some of the problem in getting numbers like this, though, like I, I can see for a different industry that it would be a completely different story. But um, as, as far as this group, um, like, could guerrilla tactics be like more effective, like actually going to the games and seeing, you know, um, or getting endorsements from groups that attend the games every single time. So. Yeah, uh, well, yes. We're just talking about here with a simple question. We want to print up some flyers. It's not really trying to answer the question of, you know, is that even a good marketing strategy? Let, let's say we've determined that, yeah, we want to print up some flyers. But you're saying maybe you go to a few games first and count people? Right. You could do that. You could do that. As a matter of <laughs> fact, there's no reason you can't do both. Have a model and also, you know, count people. What's the benefit of a model other than just counting people? Exactly. You've got some variables you can test and you can play with in your model, and you can then compare maybe one stadium versus another. If you decide to go to from Landshark or whatever it's called now, is it Dolphin Stadium again? I don't know. But, and, and let's say you wanted to go to uh, uh, you know, some other stadium, you know, but uh, in Virginia, 
or University of Florida, you want to do the same thing and sell grills, of course, not with the UM colors, but different colors, you would have a way of plugging in a different capacity, and you could model that so you don't have to go count everywhere. Okay, I'm not saying you shouldn't count, but this is the reason why you have a model. Um, so the preliminary, if you, if you do the numbers, you come up with uh, 2,000 per game. Um, you can test that sensitivity, as we've just been talking about, by, okay, well, what if 50% don't show up, but 40% show up? What if 25% don't have the, the grill, but only 18% do? And you can kind of model this and see what's sensitive and see, you know, how much can you be off and still not really make a big difference. So um, let's say we determine that going through a sensitivity analysis, which is, is a fancy word for just kind of manipulating those variables a little bit and seeing how much it matters, you know. That's a, and you, we're saying, okay, it's 2,000 plus or minus 500 is how many flyers. So let's be conservative. We're going to do this the first time. We don't want to spend a lot of money. We'll print 1,500 flyers. Okay, does that seem reasonable? Now, fifth, keep in mind 1,500. I'm just going to go back for a minute to this original thing. The alternative to doing this is sitting around a table and saying, how many flyers should we print? What do you think, Jack? What do you think, Jill? And Jill says, I don't know, 30? And Jack says, no, 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 we need about like 50,000. Okay, well, let's print 12,000. What's going to happen? They're going to waste a lot of money. Okay, so this is a, a, an example of dealing with uncertainty. It's not like, you know, jumping out of an airplane with a parachute, you know, or, or skiing down a mountain or swimming with sharks or killer whales or whatever it happens to be. This is dealing with behavior with regard to uncertainty and trying to minimize the uncertainty, that is, take a calculated risk. And by doing so, you save money and you ultimately are usually more successful in trying to, um, uh, you know, develop and run a business. So you can validate these guesstimates in various ways, and this gets back to the comment we had before, once you go out and count. But once you have this model, you can begin doing customer interviews. You can make sure that the variable of people who bring food or don't bring food, you're, you're actually a little more certain about that. You can do test markets. Um, you can then start talking to insider experts, get on the phone with the industry that, you know, uh, uh, you know, is concerned with barbecues and so forth. See if you can reach somebody on the phone. Um, and you can look at the <coughs> trends of estimates themselves. Okay? The trends of estimates themselves. Um, does everybody know what the term metadata, everybody familiar with the term metadata? For those of you in computer science, I'm sure you do. What's, what's metadata? What is it? Data about data, exactly. Data about data. So sometimes it's really interesting to see what the actual data says about itself, sort of self-referential. Um, how, how does this work? Well, you can do, um, when, you, when you look at different estimates, that's different than the error of the estimate itself. It's a hard, little bit, it's almost like a first derivative, a little, little, little complicated concept, but when you estimate something, uh, you know, you're going to say it's 10 plus or minus 2, or, you know, maybe you won't even quantify it that much, but you're, you're, you have a range of error around your own estimate. If 50 people estimate it, they're all going to have their own individual ranges of error. If you look at all the different ranges of error and all the different averages, you have new information. It's metadata about the estimates themselves. Is that kind of a, you understand that, that, that concept? Um, there are a lot of different ways of doing this, but two common ways are you can do a cross-sectional, that is, how people are doing it right at one point in time. Um, and examples of that are economic forecasts and political polls. Sometimes you see on the news it says economic growth is forecasted to be, uh, the consensus of economics, of economists say it's going to be 3%. So what do they mean? Well, one guy says it's 3, one guy says it's 5, one guy says it's two, and they kind of add all these people up and say that the consensus is it's three. Well, a lot of times they're wrong. But the point is, why is that better than just, you know, Jack Smith who says it's three? 
it's an average because there's a, I'll get to the concept in a minute, there's, there is a power in multiple estimates even with when everybody has imperfect information and different kinds of imperfect information. Polling is another great example. Um, uh, any of you go to, um, I think it's realclearpolitics.com, look out, check out that site, during the election cycle. Uh, they do polls of polls, they basically take all the polls and then do their averages. And it turns out that over time, um, averages of polls is much more reliable than an individual poll, even when that individual poll has their own range of error. But don't you find oftentimes that some people are just much better than others? So if yeah. you thought I read Rasmussen is the most uh, accurate one yeah. for predicting the elections. Yeah, so, so that gets to the point of, well, maybe we really want to focus on people who really know what they're talking about and do an average of those, so then you have panels of experts, and you can, you can go that way too. The, the point I'm trying to make is that oftentimes, multiple cuts at the same thing is, is, uh, gets you to a level of greater certainty and less uncertainty than if you just take that kind of one shot. Uh, now that's if you do a cross-sectional. You can also do a longitudinal. That is, how do estimates change over time? I'll give you an example. How good is the estimate for the age of the universe? You probably don't think this applies to that, but how, how, you know, we've been estimating the age of the universe for a long time, including, you know, three or four, five hundred years ago, people thought it was, you know, a thousand years old, you know, five thousand years old. Uh, the estimate tends to, you know, uh, gone up over time. So today, how confident are we about the current estimate of the age of the universe? So let me show you this. This is uh, years going back to uh, 1987. Uh, and each one of these dots is an estimate for the age of the universe. And the green is a trend line of the estimates. And the last estimate that has, has been scientifically published is that the universe is 13.75 uh, billion years old, plus or minus 0.11. Okay, so if I was going to ask you, is that a good estimate? What do you think? Pretty, pretty good estimate, um, because the trend line of estimates has flattened out for at least 10 years. And there was uh, a big change from here to here. You know what happened here? A different technology. Of, uh, we got satellite, different kind of satellite data. They launched a satellite. Said, hey, geez, the you know, you know, universe is a lot older than we thought because we can see something we couldn't see before. So you have a discontinuity in the estimating. But this, this actually has a tremendous amount of information embedded in it. If you were to do this 200 years ago, you could get a panel of experts together and ask them, and they would all say it's right. uh, you know, 100 million years old, right. and uh, you'd still be completely wrong. Right. Just like this is probably completely this wrong. This could be completely wrong, but, but given what we know, it's... It's, uh, in other words, if I just asked you, the age, before I showed you the slide, I said, age of the universe, how confident do you feel about it? You don't know. Now what you've done is you've taken a metadata look at the data, and so if your life depended on 13.75, <laughs> uh, you know, you have a sense of whether this is a good estimate or not a good estimate, because a lot of times in business, you'll be, someone says, well, I estimate this. And what you really want to know is, is, well, fine, you estimate it, but are you even close? So how much are you willing to bet it's, you know, 13, you know between 13.6 and 13.9? You willing to bet a, anything? I mean, I would say, yeah, I, I, I'd bet on that one. Versus uh, some, I could have shown you a different graph where, you know, the estimates are all over the place. There's no trend. No one really knows. So I'm just making the point that estimates of estimates are, can be powerful. So it's another way of dealing with this kind of uh, uncertainty. And it gets to the sense that's been popularized of the wisdom of crowds. Um, this guy wrote a book in 2004. Uh, some of you may have seen that. Um, what's interesting about this is that the wisdom of crowds was difficult to access before the internet. Why? Because you had to go to a real crowd. I mean, you had to go to, you know, you had to find the physical people and ask them questions and it took a lot of time. There wasn't really a good methodology. But now we have instant wisdoms of crowds. You know, you can do one of these little polls on the web. Somebody says, you know, uh, 
uh, you know, Jack Jones just got, uh, you know, arrested for X. How many people think he's guilty? And you know, like, you know, a thousand people vote. They don't, what do they know? Well, the point is that the, it just appears to be a truism that when you get people together, even when they're not experts, the group mean is more, has information that, it, that exceeds that of an individual mean. And then, of course, you can burrow down and peel the onion and come up with the, like the Delphi expert panels, which is what you were really referring to before. You actually try to pick out who are really good predictors and let's see what they're doing as a group. Uh, you've got prediction markets. Anybody go to Intrade? Okay. Uh, why is Intrade useful? Everybody know what Intrade is? It's an electronic uh, prediction market. Um, and if they, they do politics, they do, uh, they do all kinds of crazy things, you know, like, uh, um, you know, how, how much snow is going to fall in New York by the end of, you know, March. Who knows? What do you know about snow? It, it turns out that when a whole lot of people vote on this, that the answer is better than if you just kind of came up with something. Is it better than the world's absolute top expert in the world? Uh, maybe not. But it's an amazing way to get information that was not really available before. And it can actually outperform insider knowledge. In fact, um, there's been some studies of in-trade versus so-called political experts as who's going to win various wa races. Who, who do you think wins? Intrigued by, like, you know, it's not even close. It's not even close. And who, what's in-trade? A bunch of boobs like us, you know, just uh, paying a few, you know, cents to, to make a vote. What do we know? But I guess we do know a lot collectively. Yeah. They bet on it, though. It's different than betting on it. Well, they're, 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 I would say they're investing in their knowledge. I wouldn't say they're betting. They're, it's not like Las Vegas. Well, Las Vegas, well, maybe it is Las, like Las Vegas, but let's say, let's say you were betting on the outcome of a particular race. <coughs> uh, do, do you have more potential <laughs> knowledge about that than the outcome of a slot machine? <coughs> so there's some people. Some people think they they have an insight, but you're right. People are are. You could say, but prediction markets, by the way, work if they're not. No, there's no money involved. So it's not the money that does. In trade's trying to make money on this, so they have people actually actually bet. But there's other been tests of prediction markets without any financial uh, currency involved, and they they seem to work too. Okay. Um, Let's talk about trends. So uh, that was talking about, you know, uh, parachuting into the battlefield and trying to f deal with the uncertainty of the environment when you know nothing. So the, the, the point I'm trying to make here is you don't know nothing. You can actually derive information uh, out of the mass of data that's out there. And you don't have to be kind of just like a deer in the headlights. You can actually do something about it affirmatively. Now let's talk about the situation where you actually have some data you haven't parachuted in. Uh, it's a different kind of situation. You actually see a trend. And what can you do about that? Well, the first thing you can do is plot it out. You don't have to be into math. And you don't need to you know, remember every single thing from your high school and college calculus course. You can kind of look at a trend and come to an immediate determination of, are we talking about something that's linear? Or are we talking something about something that's nonlinear? And the nonlinear could be something that's exponential. It could be a complex curve. It could be a really, you know, weirdo thing going on. Or is it more simple, like a linear trend? And by the way, certain things you can turn into linear trends by plotting in logarithmic scale because they have, you know, like the, it's a, a, a current, a constant percentage <coughs> change when plotted out uh, in its native form will look like a uh, nonlinear curve, but you can manipulate that into a linear curve. But so the first thing you can do is make a determination about whether you're dealing with something that's linear or dealing with something that is nonlinear. Now, what are kind of typical linear trends? Growth in GDP. Yeah, if, if, uh, that could be one. It's, it's, uh, what kind, what's the nature of things that tend to be linear? Well, it is slower growth, although uh, you could have a linear trend of, you know, a million percent growth and, you know, uh, well, that would become exponential. But what, what tends to be linear? Uh, 
What, are, what is a linear equation? And not to uh, press everybody on their math knowledge, but uh, uh, linear equation is, you know, uh, x equals, you know, it's a constant, coefficient. constant plus, yeah, some, it's some coefficient in front of the other variable, right? So when we're dealing with linear trends, it's one thing that's impacting something else. And it's, and am, I, am I kind of missed everybody here? Or, or, uh, okay. And a nonlinear trend has, has got some other kinds of, of complexity. So what kind of trends do we like best in business? Well, uh, well <laughs> which, uh, let, me, let, me, let me rephrase that. Which, fr which trends are easiest to predict? Linear. linear trends. As a matter of fact, how hard is it to extrapolate a linear trend? All you need is a ruler. You just draw the line. You don't, you, don't need, you don't need any math at all. You just plot it out. You just draw it. You say, well, let's see. Okay, right. You know, uh, I, could, I could extend this one out. Here's 10. I could extend it out to 20. And I go down here. So that, that's the answer. Okay, really, really simple. The, trou the trouble with exponential trends is, you know, <coughs> you really have enough data to know where the tipping point is. You really got it right. You know, it's, if you've done some math, you know that you, you got some different variables involved. Look, it's a little complicated. So we'd love to have linear trends. What do you think the biggest mistake in business probably is with regard to trend analysis? The same as academia, it's assuming everything is a linear trend. You got it. Right, right. It, is a, there's a tremendous bias to think that every trend you see is linear. Now, let me just uh, tease that out a little bit. What if we were looking at these trends only from here? Okay, so you don't know about this world. You just know about it right from here. And I said, uh, well, extrapolate those trends, please. So you take the red one and you go like this. <laughs> you take this blue one and you go like this. You take the green one and you go like that. Happens all the time. Number one mistake. Mistaking a nonlinear trend for a linear trend. Incredible mistake. And, and really smart people make this mistake. So you've got to constantly be thinking about, the, are the trends that you're seeing truly linear over a time frame that makes sense for what you're trying to figure out? Okay. Um, the world is really complicated, so you know, you're not going to see these beautiful, wonderful trends. And what you're really going to see is something like a mess. Okay, here's an example. This is the annual marijuana arrest in the United States from 1965-2008. Okay, so if you just look at that, you say, I, I don't know what's going on. I mean, it, it, what, you know, <laughs> what's the trend? I mean, you know, it goes, it goes all over the place, so it's complicated. It's complicated, but we can break this down into some component pieces. For example, um, we can say, it looks pretty, pretty likely that from uh, 1960, up through uh, 1972, this looked like it was exponential. The arrests were just going right up, right up a beautiful exponential curve. And then something happened in 1972 that appeared to end in about 1990, where it was more or less kind of a, a downward drift, but it looks pretty linear. And then all of a sudden, in 1991, uh, up to the present day, there's another kind of exponential uh, nonlinear curve. It's more like a penetration <laughs> curve, which I'll talk about more in a minute, and something else was going on. I don't know anything about marijuana arrests in the United States, but I bet that maybe two hours of research would, on uh, internet searches, it's an assignment for all of you, see. you could find out, you peel the onion, you could figure out why what happened in those years. And I bet you'd come up with some, you know, the law changed, new technology of something or other, you know, so something was going on, and you could figure that out. Why do you want to know this? Let's say your business is selling to law enforcement. Let's say you're, you're doing prison supplies. I don't know. Let, you know, I don't want to say you're in a drug business, but I mean, like, what, what would, this is useful information, and you can distill out of what appears to be chaos actually what's going on by breaking the trends into their component pieces. It doesn't necessarily tell you what's going to happen five or ten years out, Right, because we don't know. This could turn into there could be some other change in the environment. We could go back to a linear trend or something else. But you have some comfort in predicting the immediate future. 
Right? If you understand what's behind this, if you understand why we went from a linear trend to an apparent penetration trend, you, yeah, maybe it's gated by prison capacity. There's just literally no more places to put people. So if you knew that and you could try to you know, backward uh, match that to your hypothesis, you would have a great deal of confidence in a future prediction. So again, this is an example of distilling out from the environment uh, uh, you know, facts that really can reduce greatly the uncertainty that you face. But you would be wrong too, right? I'm sorry? Right. So if you're right here, yeah. okay, um, you, you might be wrong, and that's great. It's a great, fabulous segue into what I'm going to be talking about next, because there are inflection points. There are points where an apparent trend breaks, and uh, and and sometimes that <coughs> creates its own level of uncertainty. So you can't just rest comfortably here, but if you have an understanding about what was behind this, if you really do peel this onion, uh, the trend will match the reality of circumstances and you can have more or less confidence about that. But let's talk about, um, oh, what, one more thing I just want to uh, uh, talk about. Penetration curves are a very, very special kind of curve in business. Um, there, it's almost like a, you know, a, a uh, Darwinian law, uh, this stuff just happens. And you can see penetration curves in nature, in human activity, all over the place. They all look the same. Basically what it is, it's this famous S-curve. Uh, in the business world, we talk about this as the early adopters going into a mass market, going into the late adopters, or whatever language you want to uh, say about this. And these are examples, it's hard to read here, this is from 1920. To, uh, to the current time, and this is this first one here is radio. We're going from nobody using it to virtually 100% by, uh, let's say, 1965, followed by TV, cable TV, video games, VHS, satellite TV, DVDs, broadband. You get the picture. So one thing is penetrating for another. Why is this interesting? Well, first of all, it's a great way for a second kind of derivative of market growth. So let's say you do uh, the last four years of market growth, see the market's growing at 8%. <coughs> well, the market growing at 8% may or may not, is a linear extrapolation, basically. That's what you did, or that's what somebody else did that you're picking up on. But what's really important is, okay, where are you in the penetration curve? If you say it's 8% and you're right here, you're gonna be way, way, way off. If it's 8% and you're right here, you're going to be way, way, way off the other way. You're going to either overestimate or underestimate because you're truly facing a nonlinear curve, but you haven't made the adjustment for that. You're thinking of it as a linear extrapolation. So that's just one example. Yeah. I just want to make a comment on this, getting back to this whole business plan notion. I mean, this is one of the biggest mistakes I see people make when they're forecasting um, in their business plans is you have this exponential growth curve and you assume that it's going to last for a really long time. And then you, you actually get, you're making predictions that are actually silly. Um, you know, like everyone's going to have five cell phones at some point. That's just not going to be the case. So people don't like to acknowledge that there's going to be that natural, uh, um, you know, natural uh, uh, inflection point. Yeah, that's, that's, so that's really important to uh, understand. That there's a, so one is making sure you're not coming up with a, a, a totally incorrect um, estimate of something. There's a second really important implication of penetration curves, um, if they're done right, which is that one thing tends to penetrate for another. Now, if I put radio and then put automobiles, uh, no, 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 radios don't penetrate for automobiles, okay, because there are completely different uses in different markets. Does it make sense that radio penetrates for TV? No, well, not 100%, because you can still listen to the radio even if you have a TV, right? But would you agree that there's some kind of shared activity that 
getting something on the radio could substitute for getting a, something similar on TV, like a soap opera, or like news, okay, or you know, music less so. But then we have a penetration for cable or TV for video games. Do you still watch TV? Yeah, because you know you want to do something on TV other than video games. But what does video games do? It t it takes away, as as the you know the experts in this field say, is screen time. You know you're just you're not sitting in front of the screen. You're sitting in front of a different screen. So the share of screen begins to change. But why this is important is if you can figure out what s things are substituting for in your business, you will have a tremendous insight not only into the stability of what you're doing, but where the competitive threats and the opportunities are. So let's say you're in the radio business back in the 1920s, you know, and you were smart enough to know about penetration curves, and almost nobody was. And uh, you, so you're looking out there and you see this little upstart thing called TV, which was nothing in the 40s, but in 1950, you know, just kind of came out of nowhere. You're an executive at a radio station and you're smart. What are you going to start thinking about? That's right. Was anybody smart who did that? Who did it? Anybody know? RCA. I, all the companies that exist today. And what about the ones who, I mean, more or less, they, they were radio you know, companies that got into TV. What about all the guys who didn't think about this? Where are they today? They're dead. They got, they got clobbered by penetration. Why? Because... I don't know exactly, but I would guess if we interviewed them as a class, they would have said, oh, you know, we're not in the TV business, we, we do radio. Or they would have said, no, no one's going to buy these screens, they're too expensive. Or they would have said something else, but they would have not been cognizant of the power of penetration. Okay? So now let's talk about the law of unintended consequences, which gets back to that inflection point concept of the complex curve that we saw with marijuana arrests. And, you know, what if you're on this linear trend and all of a sudden, bingo, something happens. Well, that bingo is almost, well, it could be a couple things, but a lot of times it's the notion of this law of unintended consequences, which I call by the acronym LUCK. Um, what is it? It's when side effects overwhelm the significance of the impact of the original intent. It's kind of, you know, and we can come up with some different definitions of that, but it's when what you thought was going to happen the good intention, perhaps, turns it into something very different. It doesn't have to be a good intention, by the way. It could be a bad intention turns into something very different. So it's when an action has some kind of consequence uh, that is unanticipated. Um, a lot of times there might be an unintended windfall, a benefit. Sometimes there's an unintended penalty. A lot of times there's very <coughs> perverse incentives that get set up. Uh, anybody think of some of these things? Well, if nowadays I'm thinking about the Chilean earthquake, yep. converting resources from Haiti to Earth. Yep, okay, so one unintended consequence. Although, usually uh, this is a willful uh, thing. We're going to talk about earthquakes and the nature of what that is. I'm, I'm, uh, let's reserve that for a moment and get some other examples of when somebody intended to do, did something, no one intended the earthquake, no one made that earthquake in Chile. So what are some examples of an action taken <coughs> where the result or some other corollary was like really unexpected? The mortgage crisis, given all these cheap loans for the benefit of getting the Yeah, the yeah, the yeah, and actually I'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute, but that's one example. Another example? Like corporate governance, <coughs> stop giving uh, stock options to Mm -hmm. <coughs> is, it, is this a completely foreign concept? Or do you kind of intuitively think, yeah, I can imagine this happening? Or, or not? <coughs> no? Okay. Let me, let me give you an example. You're going to think this is really weird. Selfish dictator. Okay. Um, this is a, a satellite photo of the boundary line between Haiti in the Dominican Republic. Okay, and the red line is the border. Um, I think what you notice right away is it's green on the Dominican Republic side and it looks like a desert on the Haiti side. Anybody here from the Dominican Republic or Haiti? Anybody ever been there? Okay, it's like they share one big island. The island historically 
was covered by beautiful forests. So it's not like Haiti happened to be the desert part of the island. Um, anybody have any clue as to why this happened? Deforestation. Deep what? Deforestation. Yeah, okay, but how'd that happen? Because the, after the Haitians became liberated, they weren't allowed, all the other surrounding nations didn't trade with them. So they started to use coal. And coal okay, and well, that's, that may be part of it. I mean, both of these countries have had uh, um, uh, some glorious periods and some horrible periods. They both had dictators. But they, they have different, different cultures. There's a whole lot of stuff going on. They share the same island. But here's one thing that did happen. There was a dictator who took over for Trujillo in the Dominican Republic. Um, and in 1967, he instituted a tree policy. Okay, this is what the tree policy was. You cut down a tree, we kill you. Okay, cut down one tree, we kill you. They had death squads that wandered through the forests. And any time they saw anybody with an axe or a saw, even if you just carried one, they'd shoot you on the spot. Of course, if you cut a tree down, they'd kill you and your family. Um, this was an effective policy. <coughs> okay, there were no trees cut down. Why did this dictator do this? He was because he was a great environmentalist. He was a wonderful, insightful. This is 1967. This is before we even knew about environmental impact and global warming. Never heard of it back then. He was selling trees. He was selling trees. So what did he want to do? He wanted to create a complete monopoly over the lumber business, which was incredibly lucrative in both Haiti and the Dominican Republic because they had some of the best virgin forests in the entire world. So this guy, and Trujillo was doing the same thing, said, you know, I'm going to prevent anybody else from cutting down this tree because they're my trees. I'm the dictator. I own them all. I'm going to kill anybody who sells, cuts a tree. And I'm going to, you know, save all that for myself. And then at the same time, he said, you know, I'm not going to cut them all down. So if I do that, I won't have any trees left. So I'm going to, you know, kind of do it in a more thoughtful, managed way. I'll hire some experts from the United States to tell me how to prune forests the right way. But I'll make sure that nobody else does it so we have the death penalty. Now, Haiti had a, um, a similar dictator. Didn't happen to be in the tree business. So what happened to the Haiti trees due to the Dominican Republic tree death policy? Price. Pardon? The price, of the price, sure. price went up, but I mean, what was the, uh, uh, if you wanted to cut down a tree, where would you go? Haiti. Yeah, so how many Dominicans went into Haiti to cut the trees? Well, some, so, some did, yeah. And, and you think the border had this amazing electronic fence and, you know, the border guard, no, it didn't. It didn't. It's this kind of rough area out there. So one of the impacts was that more trees were cut in Haiti. Also, the Haitians cut down a lot of trees just because there was no penalty against it. They needed firewood, actually, because they didn't have a lot of uh, um, you know, energy resources. So this is 67, and we now come to 2010. What's the difference between these two countries? What happens when a hurricane comes through? Same island. It washes out the topsoil of Haiti. So what do you think the difference in our agricultural yields between the Dominican Republic and Haiti is? Huge. Huge. What about tourism? You'd like to go to a place where there's no trees? <laughs> kind of nice, beautiful resort areas, no trees? No, tourism is way down. What about just economic well-being generally? Huge difference. As a matter of fact, Haiti today is probably one of the poorest countries in the world. In the world. And the Dominican Republic is not. Do you know the country that is actually providing the greatest amount of relief aid to Haiti? China. No, it's actually the Dominican Republic is right up there. Yeah. So actually, this is a tale of two countries now where the differential between these two is, is about as stark as that satellite photo. And if you read Jared Diamond's book called Collapse, it was a terrific book. There's a whole lot of information about this. I think you will come to the, you, you'll, you'll probably share the hypothesis that the unintended consequence of this selfish dictator was in fact in some ways saving his country. Believe me, that wasn't his intent. Okay, so this is a kind of a dramatic geopolitical example of somebody taking this death tree policy and you kind of extrapolate it forward and it turns into a very different outcome an unexpected outcome, both for Haiti and for the Dominican Republic. 
Um, so how do you deal with the law of unintended consequences? Um, you know, you want to bring this back to earth on things that impact your own business. And what you can do is develop a hypothesis. You test it through economic analysis. You, you need to understand what the incentives are around the policy that's put in place. So you really need to understand this economically, and that will help you potentially identify new opportunities and, of course, isolate risks. Because you don't want to be at one of those inflection points, like we had on the, uh, the graph for uh, marijuana arrests, and be surprised. So if you were in that business and you saw this linear trend going down, and a law was just passed, the three strikes and you're out in California, which were going to take, you anticipated, a lot of people who might be you know, casual marijuana users and put them in prison, you might expect that all of a sudden this linear trend was going to reverse out into something very, very different. So that would be trying to think through uh, essentially the, you know, using this unexpected thing and then you could embed that in a new kind of law of unintended consequences. It may not have been that, it could have been something else that happened. I don't know what happened, but that would be um, a way of doing that. I'm just going to put up an example of beginning to think through a hypothesis. I did this, I, uh, th I'm, I, I'm not saying that this is true, I'm just saying this is a way of thinking about a hypothesis. Let's say you're in the business of um, providing uh, advice to municipalities on commuting times. And uh, this first graph is the, <coughs> the, the cost of commuting from 1980 to 2000 to, to the current time. This, this, is, this little thing is 2009. The cost of commuting. So what happened is from 1980, we had a pretty dramatic drop in the cost of commuting. And it sort of bottomed out in the, in the 90s. And then it began to edge up in the, in the early 2000s. And now we're kind of back to where we were in 1980. Okay, and, and so you, we have no idea why this is true. But you might want to think about the law of unintended consequences is what could be impacting commuting time? What possible thing could be com impacting commuting time that we haven't, um, you know, that nobody has really thought through? Could be gas prices. More people on the road. Could be more people on the road. So you want to quickly see how much is this explained by gas prices or by some kind of congestion. Easy to map because you get a gas machine. Right, right. Okay, so here's a, a hypothesis. Pardon? Who's asking this as an updated? Updated to what? To this right here. What, what is an updated? Th this, is, this is approximately uh, 2008, 2009, th th this side. This one over here is, is another chart of something, which I haven't told you what it is yet. That goes to 2007. But it starts pretty low in, in uh, uh, 1997, which is uh, right about here, okay? Right about the low point of that chart. This is just made up. But you know what this is? On the right, internet use. What possible implications could internet use have for commuting time cost, commuting cost? Yeah. What happens when people uh, work remotely? We'll see, we'll see, what, uh, uh, roll that forward a couple drive steps. Less. Pardon? Drive less. They drive less. They yeah. Live away. Pardon? They live, further they live further away. What else happens? They more. Pardon? If they move further away, that means that their commute time increases. Yeah, when they have to commute. Yeah. When they, yeah, but sometimes they don't have to commute. What happens to the political process with regard to the attractiveness of highways? The next bond issue in your community, it comes up to fix the bridge that we haven't fixed for 35 years. Everybody's telecommuting. Do you feel like voting for the bond? I mean, if you're talking about 40 years, uh, maybe not be a problem. <laughs> How often do bond issues come up in municipal government? About every two and a half, three years, four years? I, I'm saying, it's just a hypothesis, but here's an example of unintended consequence, which is internet use having an impact on something that's very unexpected, which is commute time. So I, I'm, I'm not putting this up here because I think it's true. I'm putting it up here as an example of thinking through a hypothesis. How did I get this data? This stuff's so easy to get on the web. That's the, the information explosion makes this like cheap, okay? Zero cost to do this kind of stuff. You don't have to hire, you know, 
You don't have to travel to the Library of Congress and you don't have to hire experts. You can kind of think this through. Let me turn to the last kind of uncertainty, which is, you know, first we had the parachuting into a battlefield. Uh, then we had thinking about trends and how to extrapolate them. The law of un unintended consequences. And then there's something that is not really, it's more like the earthquake in Chile. It's the disruption. It's something that seems to happen that may be caused, may be man-made, so to speak. It may be natural, but it is a complete break, this quantum break with, with what was there bef before. And it might be, for example, 9-11. You know, I suppose somebody could go back with 20-20 hindsight and kind of extrapolate well how this occurred. But for 99.999% of us, it was a complete shock, unexpected. So by definition, it's not predictable. And really, only what you, the only thing you can do is you can react and adapt because preparedness and precautions are, are, are too difficult. They're too expensive. We can't prepare for everything that's going to happen. Uh, I mean, you could prepare for uh, an earthquake in Florida. There are earthquakes in Florida. The last major one was uh, about 150,000 years ago. But you could, for example, you know, store a whole lot of food in the expectation, well, you know, it could happen. Could happen. Could have a volcano in Florida. You know, uh, very, very. So no, you're not going to do that. You can't protect every single risk. So the point is, you're just going to be caught, and it's an opportunity for those who were not there at the time of the disaster, so to speak. So there's an opportunity. I hate to even think about it this way, but there's an opportunity for people with regard to Haiti and Chile that didn't happen to be caught in the earthquake. If you get caught in a disruption, you know, then it's kind of like disaster recovery. It's not much of an opportunity. But when we talk about the business world and this kind of thing, when there's this disruption, if you're not clobbered by it, sometimes there's an opportunity. And one way to think about this is this little matrix right here, um, which is how much are variables coupled or not? That's the left-hand side. Coupling is this notion of... of um, connectedness. In other words, is one variable truly independent, or these variables tend to kind of work together in, in, in some kind of perhaps unknown relationship, but they're not completely decoupled. So it's the notion of independent or coupled, uh, whatever you're looking at. And then along the top is, are we talking about like a pretty simple kind of environment that's kind of stable with a, n a few number of variables, or are we talking about something really, really complicated that's really inherently unpredictable? One of the biggest mistakes in business is thinking you're down here in a loosely coupled, very simple environment, when in fact you're up here <coughs> in a very tightly coupled, complex environment. Okay, so you think you're here, and you're here and that's not very pleasant. It says keep out. Okay, this is where you don't, don't want to live. Or if you are living there, you want to be able to uh, figure out how you're going to protect yourself. So, so w when does this ever happen? Well, a great example is the uh, U.S. real estate collapse. The investors who were uh, assumed, and these are investors who were buying mortgages, they assumed that mortgage defaults were not tightly coupled. That is, if you defaulted, your default had no impact on whether you defaulted. Why? Because your default had to do with, you know, whether you lost your job, you know, you know personal circumstances, and so forth. And whatever happened to you personally, it was not going to affect somebody else. With 2020 hindsight now, do we believe, anybody in this room believe that's true? Do we think there's a network effect with regard to mortgage defaults of some kind? Maybe not, don't understand it, but we think there's some kind of network of effect. What, what might one reason be for a network effect? Well, I'd say the flow of money just completely stops. Flow of money, certainly one. If nobody can get credit anymore, that's going to affect everybody. What else? But mortgage rates. Mortgage rates, maybe. Recessions. Psychology and market participants. Mar market participants, the psychology. What about, you know, suddenly there's eight empty homes around you? You know, mar your market values, you know, different. Okay, so we, we don't believe they're, they're, they're uncoupled. And the other thing was that, that they assumed the market was uniform. As a matter of fact, they packaged these things up through Fannie Mae, assuming every mortgage is like every other mortgage. 
And, and so they believe that we're loosely coupled simple. It turned out to be tightly coupled complex because, you know, guess what? You know, mortgages aren't all the same. Uh, they're really, really different, even though the financial characteristics may be the same. Um, and that was a perfect environment. You know, this was, this was unstable. You were up here, unstable, unstable, unstable. A perfect environment for the law of unintended consequences, which was the introduction of credit default swap insurance. So all you need is a tinderbox. Okay, it was sitting there ready to be lit on fire. And somebody came along with the credit default swap insurance and said, gee, I wonder what would happen if we put it there. And this thing unraveled in the space of six, seven months. I mean, it's, it's catastrophic, okay, because people were living up here. Eric, I just, uh, I mean, it, it strikes me looking at that, I think it's a very interesting figure, but it almost, you're actually arguing that none of us should be investing in global financial markets at all. I mean, because any financial market, especially these days, is by definition tightly coupled and uh, complex, right? Uh, no, I don't think I'm arguing that. I think I'm arguing that um, if you're going to participate in, in, in that little red box, uh, I mean, I think the people got into trouble because a lot of people were actually low-risk investors, yeah. and they thought they were buying here when they, when they really were buying here. So the little German town, you know, that bought the credit, to swa you know, that, that bought the mortgage package, of, of uh, mortgages in North Dakota, thought that they were buying a stable, undecoupled, simple market in North Dakota. No, no, the, the problem was with the credit uh, swap insurance, they were in fact participating in probably the riskiest possible thing they could ever do. So it's really more of understanding where you are as opposed to saying, no, don't invest, you know, internationally or something. <laughs> um, next session is a week from today at, at noon. Is, is that okay for everybody or are people going to be on, on spring break or something? It's going to, so it's, that's all right? People are going to, somebody's going to show up again? Okay. Um, I, I need your help. I want some feedback because I could do various things, uh, and I'd like you to maybe do a class vote or, or something. I could talk about finance or accounting or customers or some kind of wild card. Um, so can I, uh, and, and for those of you who have gone through a couple of these sessions before, I've talked about um, developing your identity, legal organization. We talked about um, your web stuff last time. Um, so given what you've heard, um, how many people are interested in, for example, finance? I've okay, got a fair number of people. How about accounting? That's incredibly an interesting topic. You should be interested in accounting. Huh? So accounting gets less customers? A lot for customers, okay, a lot for customers. So-called wild card? We don't know what that is. <laughs> All right, so I think maybe I'm going to talk about customers. Does that sound like a, a useful thing to talk about? Okay, great. Any questions, comments? For those of you who need to leave, because I know we're, we're up against the hour, please do so. But uh, anybody who wants to stay around, happy to talk about whatever is on your mind. Any questions, comments? Yeah. I'm sorry. It's called Demon of Our Own Design. Okay, great. I didn't know about that. Yeah. Super, thank you. Or when genius fails. Yeah. Great. I don't know about that one either. Well, thank Look you it up. Very Thanks. Very